Not all these questions I'm asking are going to be, you know, groveling questions. I, w- I want to ask you a really tough question here. Okay, yeah, good. Who's that transporter? It's Galvatron. Leonard Nimoy or Frank Welker? Who was the better Galvatron? I, I, I can't possibly say. I mean, they're both brilliant actors voice actors you know i mean i i I thought it was an amazing cast they got for the movie so you know brilliant that they had leonard nimoy for that and you know Orson wells and eric idol uh but you know you know the 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 original guys you know they 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 created the voices we all think of for those characters, you know, Peter and Frank. So, you know, they are, to me, though, they'll always be the voices I hear in my head when I'm writing their dialogue. I had a feeling that you were going to answer that way. And in the event that you did, I wanted to share my answer with you too. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to pick either. I would just explain it away that when Unicron created Galvatron out of Megatron's remains, he gave him Leonard Nimoy's voice. But when Judd Nelson's Rodimus Prime tossed him into the fiery distant planet of Thrall, the plasma baths that he was entombed in reverted his voice box to to the Frank Welker voice. Well, that sounds like a good explanation to me. (laughs) Yeah. Because I wouldn't have been able to answer this next thing is not a question, but thank you so much for dispelling the whole Primacron and created Unicron thing. That was ridiculous. Well, you know, sure. I mean, it was just that that was my take on the origin. You know, in these days, you know, there's probably a whole other take on the origin. But yeah, at the time, it just felt like that was the way we wanted to go with the storyline. As close to now um, as I think there is, um, in Transformers Prime, they were still using the uh, Unicron and Primus origin story. Based on an existential point of view, do you think that the Transformers Generation 2 timeline and the Regeneration 1 timeline coexist? Um, The trouble is, you know, because we did Regeneration 1, it kind of overwrote Generation 2 in as much as we took elements of Generation 2 and used them in, in Regeneration 1. So they can't really all coexist neatly. But Generation 2 always felt slightly more apart from Generation 1, whereas Regeneration 1 was very much meant to be a direct continuation of that original Marvel comic book. In the presence of all the other hot rods that mm, Hot Rod comes across in his visions, one of them was the Generation 2 Mm -hmm. hot rod. So mm, that would lead me to believe that even mm, if it's not directly connected to the original Marvel G1, that it was one of the splinter factions. In the sure. Game. I mean, I, I think, you know, this idea of, you know, splintered timelines and multiversal, you know, versions of the story. It's just that, at the you know, at the end of issue 80, in one timeline, it goes into G2, and in another one, it goes into Regeneration 1. Yeah, the uh, multiversal plane in any comic book universe done the right way definitely spices it up. It said on TF Wiki that apart from the original Generation 1 cartoon, that you were a big fan of Transformers anime. What were you know, some of the key elements of it that appealed to you? I'm a big fan of most of the animated show, but Transformers animated seem to have, uh, you know, I love Beast Wars to death. I think that was, you know, possibly my favourite. But uh, Animated had that same, you know, level of of cohesiveness and intelligence and, and, and sense of its own self about it that I really liked. It had its own, you know, vibe, its own sort of way of being Transformers. And I really enjoyed that series just because I think it was very well devised and written and thought out. So, you know, yeah, it was just, 
it was just a pleasure to watch that series and you know some very talented people behind it what i liked about it um was the fact that they brought um john machita jr Corey burton mm. And Judd Nelson and even Weird Al Yankovic back in, into the into the voice verse. Who's that transformer? It's animated RC. Well, I think you know it's always nice to involve the people who've been there, sort of in earlier incarnations of the series, a bit like we did with Regeneration One you know, bring back some of the artists who worked on those stories that we were continuing and, and concluding. So, yeah, you know, I think that that's always a nice touch. The only thing about it that kind of rubbed me the wrong way was it was kind of hard for me to swallow because it had the same animation style as Teen Titans. Hmm. You know, but again, you know, I suppose... <laughs> Most of these animated shows live in the, you know, whatever the world was at the time in terms of what's in with animation. And I could see that that worked for the time. And I still kind of like it. The fact that Tara Strong was in it more than makes up for it, in my opinion, though. So for the people who are watching this that aren't familiar with the term, Ferminisms were like expressions that were used in, in your creations that were frequent nods to you and the way you handled the comic, what the characters would say and stuff. What would you say are some of the most frequently used Ferminisms? Well, I mean, you know, these are things that obviously I, I just sort of, they're staples of my comic writing, really. And yeah, somebody at some point said, oh, look, these are, you know, used regularly, you know, reap the whirlwind and predatory bird and various other ones you know and you know things like it never ends and and whatever else just you know but it's a fun thing you know I mean I really it, it I never really realized I was doing it at the time but nowadays I you know especially I write for a game called Transformers Earth Wars and we it, it's got a slightly breaking the fourth wall nod and a wink style to the writing that goes into the story and we often you know reference blatant ferminisms in those dialogues that they have and and often call them out as exactly that so you know it's become a little sort of thing we can sort of self-parody if you like which is great fun taking a break from the transformers elements of your work can you provide us with a background on death's head sure well death's head when i was working for marvel uk on transformers uh, marvel uk launched their own american format comics one was called dragon's claws and the and the other was called death's head which sort of spun out of that but of course death's head had appeared in transformers as well you know we debuted him there you know we we put did a little marvel strip with him in but then dropped him into transformers and he went from there into his own original comic you know and he was just initially he was intended as a fairly sort of throwaway supporting character in the storyline he was in you know, because it was a slight parody of Westerns and Spaghetti Westerns in particular, the storyline, we needed a bounty hunter character and we dropped him into the mix and he became very popular and since then has, you know, lived on in the Marvel Universe. He's still featuring in comics today. So, uh, you know, it, it's again very satisfying that he's now 30 plus years old and and, and still going strong, which is great. And, you know, now I'm only hoping eventually he'll turn up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which would be, you know, a real sort of crowd pleaser for me. So, yeah, you know, he, he's, uh, he's just been my other sort of mainstay alongside Transformers. And, you know, I feel very paternal about the character because I created him with Jeff Senior back in the day. And since then, Jeff and I, well, we continue to work together. We've got a creator own series at the moment called To the Death, which, uh, you know, kind of pulls on a lot of our greatest hits, if you like, 
into something new. So, you know, there's a flavour of Dragon's Claws, there's a Death's Head-like character in it, and there's a few mechs kicking around. So, yeah, we, we've sort of, I suppose, pulled Death's Head along with us, really, throughout our careers. And, yeah, he, you know, it's great to see he's still a very established Marvel character to this day. When I saw what he looked like last night, um, when I did my research, I couldn't help but notice that even though he was created before, he looks a lot like Emperor Zerk from Toy Story. He does, yeah. And this, you know, yes, Death's Head preceded that character for by some ways. Mm -hmm. But yes, there but there was a definite look to the the Toy Story character that although it wasn't exactly Death's Head, had definitely had some shades of him in there. But you know, that's great as well. It just means somewhere that character sunk into a consciousness and appeared as a different character. So that's great. And the fact that Marvel and Disney go hand in hand kind of mm, sort of cements it mm, a little yeah. more. Yeah, it does now. Yeah. demanding would you say the role of a writer is and have you ever clashed with any other tf scribes besides ron friedman the only thing that i think you two clashed on was the female autobot in concept yeah i don't think we i don't know ron and we've never really met so we've never really clashed either it was just you know he had his take on things i guess i had mine but there was never any clashes such as we you know I don't know whether he was aware of my stories and it wasn't really a clash at all but no I mean I haven't really you know there's always room for other writers to come on and do work on the storylines I've started it happened very successfully with IDW with writers like James Roberts and John Barber coming in and you know taking things I'd conceptualized and taking them in wild new directions you know so no it's that's just the way it goes there's no uh, there's never any sort of resentment about other writers coming in because you know as long as they don't sort of just discard things or or trash things you just think well great you know look at what you've done with what you know the little sort of foundations we built back then so it's great you know, no, no clashes. At the end of the American Marvel run, there was a tie-in basically with uh, with the toy line concept of mm, the Action Masters with Nucleon, and like with mm -hmm. Grimlock and Optimus Prime. As a writer for Marvel, how closely did Marvel work with Hasbro in to keep the in comic going alongside the toy line? Yeah, I mean, we were, we've always worked hand in hand with Hasbro and. You know, Bob Budiansky, who wrote the American comic, American Transformers comic before me, you know, was very much involved in the sort of the next wave of product of toy that came along and feeding them into the storyline. It was less so by the time I took over. But Action Masters, Micro Masters, they were part of the, the character roster then. So, you know, I was happy to bring them in and and the Nucleon thing helped to rationalise the Action Master idea. And that was one of the things we didn't never really got to pay off. So once we got to Regeneration 1, we were able to do that more. One of my personal favourites of the Action Master saga in, in the last few issues of in the first run that you did. Who's that Transformer? It's Decepticon Croc. Croc was fun. I was, I was glad that you brought him back in, in Regen. There, there, were, there were some good characters there. You know, I never quite got the gimmick of Transformers that didn't transform. You know, it, it didn't sort of have the same clout to me as some of the other ideas. But, you know, we used it in the story 
and you know it always pushes you as a writer to find interesting things to do with that concept even if you don't I suppose particularly love it yourself what would you say are your greatest contributions to the Transformers mythos at large like Primus yeah I mean I suppose it's that bigger backstory that we brought to it and how we sort of brought Unicron into the mix from the animated movie but made him a bit of a part of the whole history of the Transformers and you know then we we had Primus and then the 13 and and those larger things that have endured into other iterations of Transformers are the things I suppose I'm most proud of that you know we have created fundamental storytelling linchpins that now go into every series or you know are part of you know the the sort of hasbro playbook i suppose of transformers that these are the the main pillars of their storytelling you know primus the 13 you know some of the stuff that i created think you know plenty of stuff that bob and other writers threw into the mix that's now part of a kind of more aligned Hasbro Transformers universe. And so, yeah, you know, very proud to have had a small part in that. Here's, here's a little creative question for you. If you can, who are your top five favorite Autobots and top five favorite Decepticons? I know that Galvatron is one of your all-time favorites and so is Grimlock. Yeah, yeah, those two definitely. But, you know, I mean, I... Sometimes I've I've come to love more the characters that I've had that they were there was less about initially. So Thunderwing and Bludgeon and um, Nightbeat, Hardhead, maybe you know some of these characters that you know even in Beast Wars, you know we used the little character called Razor Beast who really hadn't been anything more than just a toy in terms of fiction. So, you know, it's it's the ones I find I enjoy and love most are the ones that I've helped add layers to, you know, Prime, Megatron. These guys were were fully formed. You know, there was there was very little to add to those. And I feel that the ones I, you know, feel very close to, I suppose you'd call it, are those ones where I've I've built their characters up or maybe taken a fairly forgettable or small toy and turned it into a major league character in the fiction. And I think, yeah, they 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 sort of fall into my favorite category. But could I name five of each? Not necessarily. You know, just there's there's a whole range that I've had odd hands. You know, suddenly I'm a real big fan of Punch Counterpunch because he's been so integral to Secrets and Lies. That was you know, a new one for me, really. You know, I hadn't really delved into that character at all, but now suddenly he's right up there with some of my favorites. Where can fans, both in the United Kingdom and here, where would they be able to find the uh, UK only material? Well, I mean, the UK, a lot of the UK material has been collected now, either by Titan originally or since by IDW. Uh, recently over here they did a series called Transformers the definitive G1 collection which I don't think was available in America but you can still find and they collected all the UK and US Marvel material and in fact John Paul Bove coloured up a lot of the black and white UK strips that had only ever existed in black and white and those were reproduced in colour for the first time in the definitive G1 collection. So, you know, those are the best resources, I suppose, to find them. RDW did their whole range of Transformers UK stories as well. No, no, I mean, JP is a great colorist and, you know, sort of, if, if there's someone I can trust to completely get what we're trying to do with a series like Secrets and Lies, it, it's definitely him. He sort of understands all the nuances of how Transformers comics have been coloured, you know, whether, you know, between Marvel UK, Marvel US, different eras. So, you know, he was always able to, to interpret everything without me having to put in huge amounts of 
color notes he just knows that stuff artists have in times or in creations that they look back on they're like i can't believe i ever did this have you ever had one of those moments you know like with something that you've created no i mean you know there's there's ups and downs with you know seeing your writing turned into visuals sometimes it's it's great. It's exactly what you imagine. Other times it's far, and, and often it's far better than you imagine because they're artists. That's what they do. Sometimes it doesn't quite work, but, you know, I've never had huge issues with, you know, seeing my work drawn and, you know, I don't think I've ever had run-ins with artists at all over that, you know, sometimes is good. Sometimes is, not so good sometimes is simply amazing. Uh, but I find now that the, the Transformers artists working on the books, they know it, you know, they grew up with it. They, they know it in and out. So it's very, very rare. I think I would ever find fault because they know the visual side of it so much better than me. So, you know, no, it's, it's the short answer. Okay, so one of the things that I've had a hard time understanding was the UK exclusive storyline where Scourge, Cyclonus, and Galvatron traveled from the distant future, maybe not so distant future, to 1991. And this temporal cataclysm that came when Shockwave killed them, if they'd already existed in the future, how would their death in, in, in the past create this cataclysm? Well, I think the you know the idea is that once you mess with time, you know you pull a thread somewhere, it creates a bigger problem somewhere else. So I mean, I think that was it. It's just like you know you can't really mess around to that degree in the time stream without there being, you know, it it creates almost like a a time dam and everything sort of breaks spectacularly. So I think that was what we were getting at there that once you start jumping around and changing things time itself derails and the future isn't the future anymore that makes sense is there anything that you would like to say about your role in the transformers or whatever that has not been touched upon well i mean it's it's always you know been a pleasure and a privilege working in the this amazing universe that's come out of just what was in the start just a, a toy line i guess you know but now is so much more it's a whole brand it's movies it's more so you know whenever and, I, and i'm still getting to work in Transformers with those characters and really it's been the mainstay of my career it, it's it's sort of guided it it's supported it, it and it still carries on you know at the moment I'm working on one Transformers game and bubbling under are a couple of other Transformer projects and you know there's always the chance that we might do some more Secrets and Lies Transformers 84 style stuff in the future so you know I feel you know genuinely privileged to have been a part of it and for it to have really you know it still sustains me as a writer and and you know as just in the simple matter of earning a living you know Transformers has really been a big part of my whole career so you know I'm just generally grateful to Transformers itself to Hasbro and the companies that have employed me but most of all I think to the fans who have kept it going all this time who have who have you know loved what I've done or you know like what I've done and and then you know turn that into something that has sustained the brand for all this time so you know I just feel generally privileged to have been a part of it all. I'm really glad that you were in and are. I mean, Transformers today would not be the same if it weren't for you, Buddy Anski, and everyone that followed. So, oh, yeah, I mean, as a fan, I want to express my heartfelt thanks to everything that you've done to make it what it is. Well, thank you. You know, I mean, I feel I'm just part of a, a lineage myself of creators who've brought different aspects to the thing that it is today to make it what it is. And, you know, I'm very happy to be a part of that, 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 that lineage. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time, Simon. This was a real honor to, to interview you.
It's been a pleasure, Jeffrey. You know, happy to chat, you know, always. Uh-huh. Well, stay safe and stay well. Yeah, thank you. And 